For more than 100 years, Nikon has been making cameras that have been the first pick for companies like NASA and Nat Geo. Today we'll be looking at their latest attempt to create the best camera they can. Having these two, you have this real kind of opposing motion, and then it comes up to the moon. So, one of the most interesting thing about the Z9 for landscape photography is the fact that this is a flagship that can be used for landscape photography. Um, that's something that's very new for the digital age of cameras. I think, you know, back in the day, a film camera, like a good film camera was a good film camera, you could shoot landscapes or whatever. But when it moved to digital, the flagship gripped bodies by the big companies tended to be focused towards sports and action and wildlife. They were lower megapixel and they just weren't designed for landscape photography. So you had other digital cameras that were best for landscape photography. Um, the Sony A1 previewed that a little bit. It's their it's Sony's flagship, but it had the same body design. And I feel like having this gripped big body be a good landscape um, photography camera is kind of a new and, and unique thing that honestly only Nikon has right now. The uh, Canon R3 is, is solid for landscape photography. It's very good image quality, but it doesn't have the megapixels that a typical landscape photographer might want. The last time that I bought a new camera and feel like I really saw a huge bump in image quality is when I purchased the Sony a7R2 back in 2016. Since then, I have gone through many, many cameras with very similar megapixels and image quality has been largely flat. This is something that us as landscape photographers are coming to grips with is that image quality is here for digital. We are, we are at a really fantastic place for image quality. So when we go out and we get a new camera now, that's not what we're looking for the same way that we used to in the past. I remember way back years and years ago, every time you got a new camera, you got a whole, it looked so much better, the files. And now, you know, the Z9 drops in in a fleet of very similar megapixel cameras. The Z7, Z7 II, and the Z9 are all 45 megapixels in the Nikon system. Add on to the Canon R5 and Sony a7R2, R3, R4, R5, you get the picture. So when I set out to review the Nikon Z9 for landscape photography, I had to stop and think, what makes this camera better or worse than all of these other 45 megapixel cameras that we're shooting with nowadays. And I think I came up with kind of three areas that I feel are really uh, places to look. And that is the design and usability of the camera, the ecosystem that this camera sits in. And then there's kind of a third category that I'm gonna call X factor. And basically what that is, is that's like what what is Nikon baking into this camera that other camera companies don't have? Let's talk about this first uh, criteria for evaluating the Z9 for landscape photography, and that is the design and build quality. I have not had a mirrorless camera that I've personally used that has felt quite so uh, professional as the Nikon Z9. And I think professional is the right word Nikon went out of their way to design a quote unquote God camera. And I think Sony beat them to the punch a little bit when they released the A1. But I feel like the Z9, as I think I mentioned in the field, it's fully gripped and it has the DNA of the D5, D6, D3. Yeah, 
the, the, quite literally the F4. And we're going to get into that in more in a second. There's so much about this camera that is designed that landscape photographers can, uh, I think the right thing to say is take advantage of. So it's fully weather sealed, like crazy good weather sealed. I've heard stories in the field of people completely submerging these with lenses. It's crazy weather sealed. It's crazy durable. And that's a huge, you know, you can see that in things like the memory card door, which is uh, actually hard to open. And then the battery compartment here, it's like, it's all just like so tight and weather sealed. And the Z mount itself, you can tell like it has this little ridge that when you put a lens on, I'll put on the 24 to 120, which when in a second I'm going to talk about is a huge advantage for landscape photographers. Uh, it actually, the, the, the gasketing slides into this groove. So it's like, I don't know, it's crazy weather sealed, the Z9. Then actually right here, this is another design element. Let's talk about right now is the sensor shield that comes down. This is not the shutter. This is a specially designed sensor shield to come down so that when you swap lenses in the field, dust, muck, grit doesn't get in the sensor. Now, am I swapping lenses in a sandstorm or a rainstorm? No, I am not. But it's still, it helps you maintain image quality in the field and is something, honestly, a landscape photographer or a sports photographer or wildlife photographer are going to be the primary people to take advantage of. The, another design element that is fantastic for landscape photographers is this back screen. So the tilt flip screen thing I have as a stills photographer, I like it to be centered under the eyepiece where it comes out. It's not the, the flip screen. I understand a lot of people like the flip screens and the A7R5 is kind of best of both worlds, which is really cool. But this one flips out like this. And when this is sitting on a tripod and you're looking down on it, this is just a great user experience. I love it. There are a lot of other little things that Nikon has included in the design that are, again, landscape photographers can take advantage of. There's the bracket button up here. Just setting up a bracketing is as easy as pressing this button. This dial right here takes you to timer mode. The buttons light up in the dark, which we'll get a shot where there's a little darker showing, but that's super nice for shooting at night. It actually has a starlight mode for astrophotography, which allows you to basically see your composition and, this, and focus on stars, which I haven't actually used because I haven't used this camera for astro. And there's a host of other things on this camera and the camera design that are fantastic. Oh. It goes up to 30 minutes where you can have a shutter speed of 30 minutes, which for long exposures at night or just in various other applications, it's been 30 seconds capped at 30 seconds for so many years that having it be able to go beyond that is so nice. You don't have to use a remote. You can just use the timer and then set how long you want it to go and just let it go. It's great. So I've been talking a lot about features that landscape photographers can take advantage of and they have on here that are just great for landscape photography. But there's a lot of things on here that maybe a landscape photographer doesn't need. Like there's all kinds of buttons and switches and dials to do things that this camera does that landscape photographers wouldn't necessarily use it for. So that when you're getting this camera, you really are getting this do it all camera, which, you know, gives you a lot of capabilities. Maybe you didn't have before, but it comes with the drawbacks of that. It's huge. This is not a smaller light camera. It has a grip, which, so the grip. This has been the hardest part about this camera to me because I've always wanted a gripped camera ever since I, you know, I used to see people shooting with the, the D4s back in the day or D3s probably when I was starting photography and the, you know, 1DXs. And I was like, man, I want a gripped camera. It seems such a big deal. One of the main ways that I do landscape photography, if you follow me on this channel at all, is, is that I shoot panoramas and I shoot them vertically, right? So this gripped design should be amazing for me. 
And it is when I'm actually shooting, when I have a lens attached and I am shooting a panorama with the 24 to 120 right now, which has been my most used lens on this camera. This is absolutely amazing. I love this experience. The problem is, is that I have to get this script camera into the field to use it like this. It, uh, it's very hard to use one of the capture clips on your backpack. It just, it flops around too much. Maybe you can put up with it, but I can't. So I put it in a bag and then there's a lot of kind of more outdoor focused hiking bags that this camera just, it fits in, but it's, <laughs> it's cozy. My favorite time I've gotten to use this camera for landscape photography, we actually took a multi-day trip to the Eastern Sierra Nevada mountains and Death Valley and several other places out there. And I got to use it for landscape photography for several days. So I'm actually gonna hop out there and tell you about the lenses, the primary lenses that I've used on this camera. All right, so for this trip to review the Z9, I brought three lenses for it. And we'll go from widest to tightest. So widest is the 21.8. This is my favorite wide angle for the Z system. I've used the 1424 a little bit. I've not used the 14 to 30, but I hear good things. But I just like that it's 1.8, it's small, it's light and it's, uh, you can take filters for video work. So yeah, I went with the 21.8. And then my main workhorse lens, at least so far for this trip, and I think will continue to be is the 24 to 120 f4. I really like this lens. It's probably my favorite standard zoom I've ever used for landscape photography. It's small, it's light, the ergonomics are good, and it's very, 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 very sharp. But, the biggest lens I've talked now so I've talked a lot of I don't know I've talked a lot about the Canon 100 to 500 and I've spoken somewhat negatively about the Nikon 100 to 400 so I decided for this trip to try out what's supposed to be the biggest well not the biggest but the best telephoto zoom for Nikon, which is the 180 to 400 F4. So it's bigger and heavier than the Nikon 100 to 500. Although it's smaller in person than it looks in pictures. I don't know if you can tell that in this video here, but it's super duper sharp. And uh, yeah, so I'm trying it out and I'm going to make a decision on this trip as to whether this is something that I want to add to my kit permanently. But uh, I'm super excited to try it out and use it and get to know it. It seems so far, it seems super, super sharp. It has the built-in teleconverter, which is cool. And uh, yeah, so hopefully the shots over the next few days will bear out how worth it this monster of a lens is. It does get even huger. Huger? Huger. If you put this on, it's like a cannon a cannon, like a, a military cannon. <laughs> the lens hood doesn't make it like a cannon camera. It'd have to be white. Okay. Like the ground. <laughs> like the ground. It'd be blend in. We're in Death Valley at the yeah. moment. It looks so like it's looks snow great. and ice and like it should be super cold. And it is in fact salt. And it is not very cold. So, very cool. Very nice. The second criteria that I talked about for evaluating the Nikon Z9 for landscape photography is the ecosystem. So what do I mean by ecosystem? Well, I guess I mean the Nikon Z, the Nikon Z series. I don't know, like you have this adapter that allows you to use F mount lenses on the Z9, which is great. It actually performs very well. Uh, in that in earlier I talked about that I used on the trip the 180 to 400 and I guess to end the suspense suspense now I did not keep that cam that lens so this adapter allows you to use lenses f mount lenses both new and old um, 
you're not going to get out of focus with some of the old lenses. The uh, D1H back there has a 51.4 on it that you can manual focus on this uh, camera, but you can't autofocus. But you can mount it and take images with it, which is super cool. So um, this adapter, to kind of just talk about it because it's part of the ecosystem, this adapter, I'm not the biggest fan of. So in my opinion... Nikon should have made this adapter to the quality of the most expensive and biggest lens that you would put on it. And I do not feel like it is. I feel like this thing is a liability. I feel like if I were taking, for instance, if I were going on a huge trip, I would want a backup of this. I mean, I'm sure it's fine. Again, it's just another fail point. And I feel like if you Again, if you took a huge lens like that 180 to 400 or a 4028 or a 600 f4. So, if you're going out of country with a huge lens, something like the 600 f4, 180 to 400 that I was talking about, I just feel like this thing is is both great because it enables you to use it on a on a modern camera, but also a little bit of a liability. I just would have liked to have had it be made out of metal. I would have liked the switches to feel just a little uh, tougher. But anyway, that's just me on that. So when I'm talking about the ecosystem, the main thing is the lenses. So the Nikon Z lenses are absolutely fantastic. They are probably the best lenses that Nikon's ever made. I mean, well, no, they are the best lenses that Nikon's ever made. And my favorite of them. So honestly, this could be a point all on its own because the reason the Z9 would be great for landscape photography is this 24 to 120 right here. This is the best F4 standard zoom I've ever used. It's also maybe the best standard zoom I've ever used. I, I'm trying to think of one. The, the 24 to 70 Nikon, which I have a review of on this channel, link in the description, is a fantastic lens, super sharp. I've, it's the only 24 70 I've actually used for landscape photography consistently. Um, but I don't have that lens anymore because I didn't need it anymore because this one is smaller, lighter, sharper, and gives you up to 120, which I think is really nice. Instead of capping it at that 105, you get that little extra, which means that I'm just less inclined to pack a telephoto, you know, if I don't really need it because I get that little extra reach. So 24 to 120, a fantastic lens. I used it hands down the most on the trip. I got a lot of really good shots with the uh, 180 to 400, but I took way more of this. And then uh, I have the 21.8, I already talked about it, but these little 1.8 primes are interesting, so we can just talk about them in general as part of the ecosystem. Uh, Nikon doesn't have, Nikon has 1.8 primes that are S lenses, so they're their higher range. They're very sharp, they're very great, they've got good build quality. They're on the expensive side for 1.8 lenses. Uh, the 20 here, I think goes for, I think I paid 700 for it used, but I think brand new, it's like 11 something maybe. I'm not sure, we'll put it on the screen. Uh, the 50, 1.8 is really nice. Mm -hmm. And then back here, this is the other series of primes. They just announced the 85.12, and then this is the 50.12 that I tried out for a portrait shoot and uh, crazy sharp and also crazy big and just crazy. So uh, the lens ecosystem for, for the Nikon Z series is really good, all high quality. I don't feel like it's as unique as Canon's, if that makes sense. I feel like Canon is pushing more the development of the new lenses into a new arena. For instance, the 7200 is shorter and lighter and easier to pack. You have the 100 to 500, which, you know, is like a 100 to 400, but it goes to 500. And then is also super sharp. I've talked about that lens too much. And then, <laughs> and then, you know, you have the 28 to 70, whatever. I mean, you might not use that lens for landscape photography that much, but you kind of get my point. With Nikon, things are a little bit more traditional. I think the exception to that rule would be this 24 to 120. Now, this is not the first Nikon 24 to 120, but it's the first that's up to this image quality. But they're being a little bit more conventional with their releases. There's the 100 to 400, which I have another video about that it's kind of controversial, but 
I, in my experience, it didn't hold up at distance as well as some of the other lenses. I, I, you know, I wish I had tried more than one copy, but you know, that's kind of the way it is. It's a great lens. Honestly, if you're a landscape photographer, you're going to really love it. But there's another thing about the ecosystem is that you have the Z7 and the Z7 II. And this is where things get dicey for our friend Z9 here, because while for virtually every other genre of photography, whether that be portraits or sports or wildlife or events or anything else you can think of, the Z9 is absolutely top-notch, super superior to anything else Nikon has. It's actually a liability, I think, for Nikon that this is the only, I think, competitive camera as far as you know the whole of photography goes. For landscape photography, the Z7 II, for a lot less money, <laughs> has at least 90%, 90%, 90% of what the Z9 brings to the table plus it's smaller and lighter and it is you know you can get them for half of the z9 so i have a whole video again about the z7 II, but you know so that to me as far as the z9 goes you know it's a great it may make a great second body so you could look at it that way but you could also look at it like why would i get a z9 instead of a Z7 II. I do think there are reasons. The starlight mode, the build quality is higher. Um, just some of the overall design functions are better, but you know, it doesn't have a shutter. It has the shutter shield. So there's a battery life is way better. So, you know, those are some things that the Z9 has, but the Z7 II comes back with being cheaper, lighter, so um, an elephant in the room that we should probably address, even though it's not landscape photography, is the video aspect. And I'm putting this in the ecosystem segment because the Z9 is absolutely astoundingly good for video. It shoots every type of video in every type of format you'd want. It's the autofocus is good. The image quality is good. It's fantastic. Uh, the problem is, is that the rest of the Nikon ecosystem is pretty terrible for video. Um, including that Z7 II is still 8-bit. Like, it's just, as a whole, the Nikon ecosystem is not fantastic for video outside of the Z9. So that's like a little side note ecosystem thing. And then also just to tell you that, like, if you're interested in video as well, so that would be a real reason to buy the Z9 if you're a landscape photographer and also are interested in doing video because it is so good for video. Okay, so before we go to our my third criteria for evaluating the Z9. I do have to talk about image quality. And <laughs> I know I talked about earlier that image quality is like a largely flat thing now between all the cameras and the systems as then like we've reached a level where like you can get great images with any camera. The Z9 and the Nikon Z system does have absolutely fantastic image quality, particularly at that 45 megapixel range. And the Z9 is absolutely no exception. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm actually gonna go through some of my favorite images of the Z9. We're going to pixel peep, and then I'm actually gonna do an edit of uh, an image, a Z9 image. So you can kind of see a start to finish raw to completion here. So let's just real quick jump in. I took this shot of the uh, lunar eclipse in spring 2022. And like, this is an incredible, incredible dynamic range. I actually took this with the 120 to 300, which I was trying out, which I love that lens. I wish that I could keep it forever, but uh, alas, and you can see the stars, the high ISO. Let's see real quick. This is ISO 800 at 300 millimeter, 1.3 seconds. It is one, a single image. And yeah, the ISO, fantastic for ISO 800. So this was a really fun image. Here we go is a, <laughs> a view you probably know and love in Canyonlands National Park, but this is with the 120, excuse me, the 24 to 120, a 
And I just love the mood of this image. I love the little bit of glow here. And then you can just see fantastic image quality. Yeah, I just, I love the colors, the, dy the dynamic range. Uh, Zion National Park in Utah, again, just really nice colors. I feel like uh, Nikon, the warm tones of the Red Rocks of Utah is just like a wonderland for Nikon. You can see the moon over here. Uh, great dynamic range. That was a really fun sunset in Zion. Uh, Death Valley National Park. And again, the colors, that Nikon blue. I feel like the, the Z9 has that signature with the, the blue here in the foreground. I feel like that's kind of a signature of Nikon. I feel like that's a way that I can kind of pick up on a, this is a focus stacked image and is extremely sharp. This is with the, I believe, uh, 24 to 120 again. So as was this one and as was this one. So the 24 to 120 is a huge deal. This is the image I'm going to edit here in a minute. Uh, here is Mount Whitney at sunset with the 180 to 400 and love the colors, love the tones, love the sharpness, the dynamic range. Next morning, Alabama Hills. The, and then this black and white, I do feel like of Canon, Sony, Nikon, Nikon converts the best to black and white. I, I don't know how to explain it. It's just their files tend to translate to black and white the best. And I feel like this is one of my favorite black and white images I've taken in several years of Lone Pine Peak. Uh, stunning image quality, stunning dynamic range. Yeah, just, I love this image. Maybe my favorite image with the Z9, maybe? Oh, uh, do I have to pick a favorite? I don't know. And Zion National Park at sunrise with this pink sky, which... <laughs> I know it looks fake. It's not fake. It was like that. It was the most beautiful December, peaceful sunrise I've experienced. And yeah, just a, a pink uh, cotton candy morning that I love. Okay, so let's jump in to doing a quick edit in Lightroom of this image right here. So I'm gonna get in the develop module. And the first thing I'm gonna do is going to crop. So yeah, this is how a raw file, a straight out of camera raw file for the Z9. So actually let's go ahead and you can kind of zoom in and see it's with the, uh, 180 to 400 at 400 ISO 64, one eightieth of a second, if that matters. And I'm going to go ahead and crop in, I think actually gonna unchain my crop here. I think I'm gonna come in quite a bit. I kind of like this rock here. Kind of gives a, 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 a grounding element. I just have the Summit of Whitney just slightly off center. So yeah, I like that. Okay, and then I'm gonna add my signature curves adjustment. Is it my signature? I don't know. Uh, it's, uh, I kind of, I, I, I like to start with this curves adjustment. It's a really simple curves. I mean, you can see it's just a standard slight S curve with the, uh, black point on the left raised slightly. And I like to do that. I like to start here because it kind of helps with my giving my images a consistent look. I oftentimes will adjust it a little bit here or there. And then, but I feel like it kind of helps me establish a baseline. So I'm gonna up the shadows a little bit. I like right now where the highlights are. And let's just see about warming it up ever so slightly. That was just, man, that was barely a warm up. And I think we're, we're doing well, maybe just a little bit of vibrance. Oh, and then I'm going to do some local adjustments. I'm going to do a radial gradient on the middle of this image. And just kind of capture the, the main focal point here. I'm going to bump the exposure, keeping an eye on my histogram up here. 
So I don't want a thing, but I want it to just feel very bright. That's a little too much. That's barely bumped. And then I'm going to bump the saturation a little bit. Again, I don't want the overall saturation. I just want the subject to be pretty saturated. And then I might warm it up ever so slightly. It's maybe a little too much saturation, but I kind of like that pop. Now I'm going to use one of the new features in Lightroom that I really like that they do is that they uh, duplicate and invert. So I can now edit everything else. And I'm going to bring down the exposure just a little bit, give it a lot, quite a bit of pop there. And I actually might reduce the contrast just slightly in the rest of the image. Just, I don't want to overwhelm the subject matter here. So reducing the contrast, the rest of the image helps the subject matter pop. Okay, so this was just like a really uh, quick and dirty edit of this image, just to kind of make it pop with the rest here. So yeah, image quality on the Z9 for landscape photography, nothing to worry about here. You're gonna get fantastic images. All right, so third and final criteria for evaluating the Z9 is X factor. And before you get super annoyed at me for using a vague term that everybody uses to describe things, let me let me tell you what I where I'm coming from on this because the truth is is that today, like I was talking about with image quality, everything that we do to evaluate these cameras is honestly nitpicking. Like it really is. We live in, I feel like the golden age of cameras. Like we, it's never been more exciting to be a camera fan. Even as the photography industry shrinks, cameras are just amazing right now and super fun and super great to use. So when I'm talking about X factor, I'm talking about something that like you can't quantify, but that like it's the what makes a Nikon a Nikon or a Sony a Sony or a Canon a Canon of the big three camera companies. They are the company that is leaning the most and appreciating the most their own legacy. And the best way for me to demo that is to actually reach back here, grab the Nikon F4 film camera. This was released in 1988, which happens to be the year I was born. So this camera is probably similar in age to me. Uh, also look at how well it's held up. Like it's crazy good. I'm also gonna grab, uh, okay, just for demo purposes, I'm going to grab this uh, D1H because <laughs> honestly, if you, if you handed me the D1H and the Z9, I would, you know, just blind. It would take me a couple of seconds of feeling around to know which one's which. I mean, as soon as you touch that that back screen or feel it, then I, that would be the giveaway. But if, you know, it's easier to see in person, but like hopefully this is translating to video, how similar are these cameras? The D1H was released in 2001, 2001. So we're looking, so kind of the halfway point, honestly, very close to the halfway point. So 88, 2001, 2021, 2021, technically. I mean, I didn't get mine till 22. I don't think most people got theirs to 22, but we'll say 21. So, so much DNA has remained through the years, such as where the bracket button is on here and the D1H and the Z9. Uh, the front buttons on the F4 and the Z9, they look and they feel the same. It was funny, on the trip, I was shooting with this camera and I was looking to do a function with the F4 that I do with the Z9 with this button right here. And it wasn't, of course, it wasn't doing it. And I also kept checking the back screen. I mean, that's a common plague with film photographers, but it's even worse with this one because I kept just like, it feels like the Z9. And to me, I really appreciate this about Nikon. I feel like Nikon knows who it is and they have, they've created cameras and have kind of, of the big three, I feel like their design philosophy is the strongest 
And if you know, if you if you like cameras for camera's sake, I feel like Nikon really is offering something super cool uh, with these with the Z9. I mean, any of these cameras. This one does not work. Uh, this one does, and t- still takes amazing uh, film pictures. So, yeah, that is that's where I'm gonna swap these out here because I want it to look cool. All right, all right. So. That's where I land with the Nikon Z9 for landscape photography. Uh, There's not a clear cut answer for you. It's an amazing landscape camera in a world full of amazing landscape cameras. There are things about it that make it fantastic. There are also some drawbacks. And I kind of, uh, I hope that today by watching this video, you've gotten a feel for how you might use this camera for landscape photography and implement it into your system. And, you know, if I have a final recommendation, if you are a Nikon shooter and landscape photography is one of the things that you do among many, then it's easy. The Z9 is a fantastic camera. It will do great landscape. It will do landscapes as well as it will do any other area of photography. If you're just a landscape photographer, then, you know, I think it's kind of up to you whether the few advantages this camera has over the Z7 II makes sense in either your budget or your general philosophy as far as weight and all that stuff. So, uh, I really hope you've enjoyed this video. Uh, if you liked it, please hit the like button because it helps us so much on this channel and subscribe to us for more camera adventure, photography, video content that we are push continuing to push out. And with that, we'll see you on the next adventure.